I mean, my favorite thing to see, actually, you know, a lot of a lot of noise is made of the um, uh, the, the the planes flying through Rainbow Canyon, being yes. able to look down on them, just because it's so cool. To, like, look over and see the guy's head, yeah, his face. You're looking down you know? on the airplanes. Yeah, that's that's so amazingly cool. But my favorite thing are the nighttime dog fights. Really, so cool, like. It, like you can tell that they're dog fighting because the lights just do all these erratic stuff, but you hear the afterburners. Yeah. So if you, um, you know, if you weren't hearing those afterburners, it would just look bizarre. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, and there's times that you know where you can't hear their afterburners, uh, but so I, maybe, I maybe they're seen too anything. far away. Yeah. Yeah. Or. The w- where their afterburners are pointed, it has a lot to do with whether you can hear them or not, too. Okay. Like, the loudest thing here is when a jet comes right above the property and then goes into a, a steep climb yeah. and hits those afterburners for the climb. Yeah. Because the, the jet wash just comes straight down onto the property. And then bounces off. That, yeah, it's and that's so much louder than them flying directly overhead even low. I mean, we had them come real low over the property here. It's yeah. really thrilling, but it's not as ear splitting as when they come low over the property or even even higher over the property, but then point those afterburners right at the property as they're yeah. as they're climbing. Um, that's that's really loud. So when you're watching something across the valley, you can you don't hear the afterburners all the time. You just hear them when they happen to be pointed at you. Mm-hmm. And at night, it's actually really neat if they're close, and they and they go into one of those climbs, and you can look right into the into the jets yes. as they hit yes. those afterburners because you can see them flare, and uh, that's just such a neat neat experience. Well, this morning we went up to Father Crowley with the the other couple that I had met, and we didn't see anything. I left about eh, a little before noon. Okay, uh, came down, got a bite to eat, went to Ballarat. Then I went up. Uh, it's been a while since I've been to the town of Darwin. It hasn't changed. But then on the way back, uh, I saw a plane going through Father Crowley. However, it was different. It was not your stereotypical silver U.S. jet. It was black and white, and it left a plume of smoke behind it. So I don't know what that was. It was maybe another country's plane or or what the heck that was. It wasn't your typical plane you see around here. Well... You're familiar with the movie Top Gun? Yes. Okay. So, obviously, that's not reality, but it is, but something like that does happen. Sure. There is, there, you know, there are, like, there's a lot of training that happens on China Lake Naval Weapon Station. Those flights through the canyon are part of training, right? So, yeah, we see the F-18s and the F-35s. Those are, like, you know, sort of our mainstay. But we see a lot of old stuff. We see a lot of uh, planes that are just trainers. Yeah. Um, and uh, and we see a lot of really odd birds. Yeah. Uh, when they were shooting Top Gun 2, um, which I don't even know when that's going to come out now, but they were shooting, they were doing principal air photography last, um, I want to say it was like November, December 2019. Um, Did they shoot it out here? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Or at least some of it. But we saw all kinds of crazy birds in the in the sky then. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was, they had some F4s up. And mm-hmm. I'm not great with uh, with sighting, you know, a lot of the, the more obscure planes and knowing exactly what they are. But there were there were a lot of uh, different things that we hadn't seen before. Sure. Um, in the in the air then. And so, so it could be, it could be filming too, because this area is so, like, it, it Movies, so many movies are filmed in this area, and yeah. especially in Lone Pine. So it, it could have been a filming, but most likely it was um, just a trainer. Yeah. You know, although with uh, I mean, uh, uh, this airspace is used by some of our allies, the mm-hmm. RAF and the RAF Australia do use this airspace. Um, I don't know exactly if they finished the project or not, but um, um, they came out with thrust vectoring for the uh, F-18 Super Hornet. And then, of course, we retrofitted all of our birds with that thrust vectoring. Um, but many of our allies came out to this base to have their to, to have their F-18s retrofitted with the, with the thrust vectoring because it really makes a... I mean, it gives them a whole new, like, lease on, on life. Um, I, 
I was reading one article that says basically the thrust vectoring, you know, extends the the service of the um, F-18 Super Hornet by another 20 years or so. So, because it was kind of getting into life. Yeah. But, but then yeah. but then they, they got the thrust vectoring for it, and now it's like competitive again. Wildlife out here. Yes. Uh, I know maybe you see different wildlife in the Panamans than you will on the desert floor. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess maybe in wintertime you have stuff that comes down. What do you see? What type of wildlife will you see around here at different times of the year? So uh, at all times of the year, you're going to see uh, your your um, your rodents, which are our most common mammal life, right? So we've got pack rats. Uh, We've got a, we've got a mouse. I forget the name of the mouse, and we've got um, kangaroo rats, which are really quite cute. Um, then you've got two different types of rabbits. You've got uh, like a desert phase, color phase of the cottontail, and then you got the jackrabbits. Um, so those are the most common mammals that you see. Uh, but you can see coyotes all year round, mm-hmm. although they're right now they're less scarce than they have been in the past. Um, Less scarce or more scarce? Less. Okay. But, sorry, no. I'm sorry. More scarce. Okay. Than they have been in the past. Because uh, of the heat. Um. No. That we had, we had, uh, we had a really big problem a few years ago, um, where coyotes had learned to um, scavenge. Yeah. From cars, and they were stepping right out in front of cars to stop them. Uh. Um. Maybe some didn't stop, but uh, <laughs> it, it, the the problem got really bad, and then it. It kind of just, it kind of just sort of started dwindling and diminishing. Mm-hmm. Potentially, people didn't stop their cars when that coyote stepped out in front. Yeah. Also, you know, human food's just not really good for wild animals. Right. Uh, and so, you know, those animals, because I'd see them when I'd go running in the mornings. Um, those anim- those coyotes, really looked bad. I mean, they yeah. really did not look healthy. So it could be that the whole pack just died, yeah. uh, which is really unusual for, for coyotes. They're actually really resilient creatures. They, they have all of these amazing survival uh, techniques that they can employ, uh, changing pack size and number of breeding pairs. And it's, they're amazing animals. Uh, but right now, we're not seeing them. They're, well, we're, we can hear them, yeah. but we're not seeing them, which is good because, because it just got so bad. Well, several years ago I was here, and I, I never stay out there on the edge because that's where the animals may come in. So right. I stay like a row back. And there was a Belgian couple who they were grilling meat, and here came a couple of coyotes. And so I took some stones, started throwing them at the coyotes, and they were trying to get them to come up. And, oh, they, yeah. and they said, don't, don't throw rocks at the puppies. We want to feed them. I said, those are not puppies, those are coyotes. And they'll take the food out of your mouth, and they won't care if you're there. And they said, well, what makes you say that? I said, look at them. There's no food out there. And they, and they looked like they were they were emaciated. Okay, yeah. They were starving. I said, they will do whatever they can to take that food out of your mouth if you let them get close. And they said, okay, I believe you. And it's not it's not good. No. You don't want them around here. It's really, it's really not. Um, I mean, I do. I actually want them around here, but I don't want them eating human food. Correct. Correct. I don't want them seeing humans as a food source. Yep. I want them around here because they eat a lot of, of rodentia, and uh-huh. they eat those rabbits. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are years where the rabbits get so bad that our whole property smells like rabbit urine. Yeah, but you don't want them to so, come to the to the. To the I don't want them and, 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 and get into the campground. Right. I don't want. I don't want people feeding them. It's not good for them. I love coyotes. I think they're amazing creatures, and they have a really important role in our ecosystem. They should. They should fulfill that role. If That's they don't correct. fulfill that role, it's bad for the whole desert. That's correct. Um, and you know, we see the same thing with roadrunners. Occasionally, we'll have roadrunner populations here, but unfortunately, people feed them, and then it throws everything all out of balance, right. and then we end up losing all the roadrunners. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's, there's nothing nothing sadder than seeing a roadrunner get hit by a car. That should never happen. Yeah. So, you, you never see it in the cartoon, do you? Nope. Nope. <laughs> and that coyote never gets that roadrunner. And that is that is for truth. Unless they uh, un- unless their unless their population gets larger than the carrying capacity of the land, and that's what happens out here. Exactly. Well, Ben, you've got your dinner crowd coming in again. Yep. Uh, let's go ahead and part. I'm gonna let you tell the listeners out there. 
the website, how to get here, what you have, how to book it. Go ahead. All right. So the easiest website to remember is www.deathvalley.com. Um, that, if you click any of the accommodation pages, that will take you over to our main website, which is www.panamentsprings.com. Uh, we are um, on Facebook and Instagram, uh, but our website is the best way to book with us. Uh, we've got pictures of the rooms. Uh, we've got the various accommodation types there. Um, and then we also have our phone number there uh, for, for, for making phone re- reservations. As we talked about before, phone's not really great for, for, for working. So you know, try to make your reservation online first. But if you need help or you, uh, or you need to book a campsite, um, give us a holler at area code 775 482 Seven six eight zero. That's seven seven five four eight two seven six eight zero. And yeah, if you if you like desert spaces uh, or just you know intrigued by the possibility that, that that you might like desert spaces, come out to the Death Valley region. This entire region is amazing. It's it's got so much stuff in it, and uh, and we're kind of the small, more boutique, rustic. Uh, um, type oper- offering that's not like as busy. We don't have as much congestion and people. It's it's well, it's just it's smaller and more authentic uh, feeling. You get you get some personal attention and uh, oh, me and my staff. What drives us is actually helping you enjoy the desert in the way that's right for you. Because there's so many different ways to enjoy the desert. Dear listeners, he speaks the truth. I've been coming out here for 30 years. This is the only place I consider staying. Give it a try. I think you'll enjoy it. Ben Castle, thank you very much. Thank you, James. That's it. We're done. W, or, uh, James Strong Show at Hotmail.com. That's the email address. Send me your email address. I will go ahead and send you a link to the podcast. And uh, upon... Uh, publication. That's the best way to listen to it. Download it and listen to it at your leisure. Or go ahead and access any place you get podcasts. And uh, I'm there. Until next time, this is James Strong saying adios.